played with them too. You know, as you answered question 10 about the smoke ascending forever and ever as people were being tormented, separated from God, I was so impressed and so thankful to know that no one has to be there. Amen. That's so Amen. wonderful. I love this chapter. You've done such a beautiful job in explaining it to us. Thank you. Chapter 15 coming up, and here are your questions. What is the purpose of this chapter? Now, in this chapter, you're going to see a sea of glass mingled with fire. What does this connotate? What is the song of Moses, and who sings its lyrics? What nation administers global laws during the millennium? Now, this is a very interesting question. Will Saudi Arabia, India, China, or Israel be the center of worship in the future? Why are angels wearing priestly garments in this chapter? Why is the temple closed during the administering of judgment by the seven angels? What makes everything hazy and dark during this period of time? When does God restore mercy and grace during the solemn, solemn Right, we have some very interesting questions here, Jack. Chapter 15, you help us to answer them. First of all, I want the folks to understand that chapter 15 is a preparatory portion of Scripture. Its eight verses serve as an introduction to the seven vile or bold judgments described in chapter 16. Let's investigate. First one, and I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath, wrath of God. The sign John now views in heaven is awe inspiring. Seven angels, possibly the seven angels or messengers of the seven churches mentioned in chapters 2 and 3, are about to pour out the final seven plagues. Right. This is the completion of God's judgment when his wrath is unleashed against the rebellious man. Verse 2, And I saw as it were a sea of glass in the middle of the fire. And then had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the hearts of God. As explained in chapter 4, verse 6, the sea of glass speaks of tranquility. It is calm and stable and typifies, one, the church at rest, or two, God's living word. Solomon's temple contained a sea of glass depicting the word of God as a means of sanctification. Notice that the sea of glass in our text is mixed with fire. This is a beautiful picture of believers standing firmly for Christ under the test of fire, having their feet planted on the Word of God. The Apostle Peter speaks of this matter when he says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than a gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, First Peter 1 7. Thus, there's no doubt whatsoever. Tribulation saints enjoy victory over the beast, his image, his mark, and the number of his name, 666, by the word of God in prayer. They die for the name of Jesus and are conquerors because of death. Had they remained alive by accepting the beast and his 666 member, they would have been losers. Instead, they are victors because to die in Christ is gain. Philippians 1.21 This is why they stand upon the sea of glass. A picture of the Word of God. And are also serenaded and soothed by heaven's harvest. Verses 3 and 4 And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true. Thy ways, thou king of sins. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. 
by judgments on the enemies. This group saved out of the tribulation, sings the song of Moses. I mean, back to Exodus 14. Moses and his people were being hotly pursued by Pharaoh and his armies. Finally, the Israelites arrived at the Red Sea. Remember? There God parted the waters so that his people could cross over on dry land. As Pharaoh's military geniuses followed, the waters closed in upon them and they died. The Israelites, realizing the protection of God on their behalf and sparing them from the Egyptian ruler, a type of the Antichrist, began to sing a song of worship, praise, and adoration to Jehovah. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord. For he had triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider had been thrown into the sea. That's his 15 months. Now, centuries later, these Jews go through death, left earth's tribulation miseries behind, sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. This doesn't mean they use the same lyrics as the people of Moses' day, but rather that they as Jews identify with Moses. They belong to Moses nationally and to the Lord Jesus Christ spiritually, for their song is also about the land. The words are great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of Saints. Verse 4 reflects the attributes of the King of the Nations during this one. Then he is revered because the world fears and glorifies his name. Also, in homage and respect to his holiness and his mighty acts of judgment and subjugation, all nations come to worship in his presence. This is in, is in harmony with Isaiah 2, 2, and 3. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion, Jerusalem, shall go forth 